Lecture 3.6, Radiative Transfer. In this lecture, we will discuss the equation of radiative transfer that describes how light passes through a medium. Before we get there, though, we'll start with some simple definitions. Radiant power is the total energy in a radiation field passing through a surface per unit time. So it has in units of uh, energy per time, or watts. Radiant flux is that, that power per unit area. So if you imagine uh, light, say, from the sun striking a surface, um, the radiant power would be the total amount of energy per unit time striking the surface. The flux is that power divided by the area of the surface. So it has units of watts per meter squared. The final quantity that we will define is called specific intensity, and it's the quantity that we will be following using the uh, equation of transfer. So specific intensity is the flux per unit solid angle in a radiation field. So you take the flux and then you divide it by the solid angle of the light source uh, in the sky. So uh, you may not be familiar with this unit of measure of uh, steradians for solid angle, so we'll review that very briefly. Remember that um, a radian is defined as the angle theta, where if you have uh, the arc length along the circle, call that s, and the radius of the circle is r, then theta is just equal to s divided by r. So theta you can think of as a dimensionless uh, quantity, even though you label it as radians, um, because both s and r uh, have the same units. They are both measured, say, in meters. Stair radians is a way of measuring solid angles on the, on the sphere. So now suppose you've got this cap uh, that's labeled with area A on the surface of the sphere, the sphere has a radius R, the solid angle, capital Omega, you can think of as almost like a 2D angle. So like radian, stair radian is also kind of a dimensionless quantity. So the area of that cap is, would be in meter squared, uh, R squared is in meter squared, and so again, that uh, that capital omega is going to be dimensionless, although we just label it as stair radian, just like you label theta in terms of radians. Because the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, if we plug in 2 pi r for that um, arc length s and then solve for theta, the r's would cancel out and you'd see that theta is equal to 2 pi. So there are 2 pi radians in a circle. We do the same thing for the sphere. Uh, the, air, the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So if you plug in 4 pi r squared for a um, and then solve for omega, the r squareds cancel. And you'll find that there are 4 pi stair radians covering the entire uh, sphere. All right, let's look at a very simple example to calculate the um, intensity, the specific intensity of the sun's radiation. So the solar constant is defined as the radiative flux of sunlight at the Earth integrated over all wavelengths. So that value turns out to be uh, 1370 watts per square meter. So every square meter of the Earth receives 1370 watts from the sun. We want to calculate the specific intensity of the sunlight, so we need both the flux and the solid angle of the sun as seen from the Earth. So the angular diameter of the sun turns out to be about 0.5 degrees. That's from one side of the sun to the other. Uh, and so the solid angle, um, since, since the sun is like fairly small in the sky, the diameter is much less than a radian we can approximate that the solid angle of the sun as seen from the Earth is just pi times its angular radius squared. So equivalent to just pi r squared being the area of a circle. So 
the diameter is a half a degree, divide that by two, it'd give you a quarter of a degree for the radius of the sun. Um, the conversion factor to go from degrees to radians is uh, 57.3 radi uh, degrees per radian. Um, so if we take pi times that radius squared, you get uh, 5.98 times to the negative fifth steradians. So that's the solid angle um, of the sun as seen from the Earth. So now if we just divide the flux that we get from the sun by that solid angle, you get 2.29 times 10 to the seventh watts per meter squared per steradian. Um, and so that is the intensity. That intensity you can think of as the surface brightness of the sun. So for example, here are here's a sequence of photos showing a partial uh, solar eclipse. So that's the disk of the sun that we're seeing, and the moon is kind of coming across, uh, taking a bigger and bigger bite out of the sun because it's it's you know we're seeing it in silhouette. So as the moon comes across and blocks more and more of the sun, we'll be receiving less total light on the earth from the sun and so the flux of the radius from the, and so the flux of the radiation is going to go down and you can see that if, you, if you've ever been in a uh, near total eclipse of the sun um, just the light starts to get lower and lower it almost feels like you're going into twilight uh, because you're blocking out more of the sun's light so the flux of the sunlight will go down during an eclipse, but the specific intensity doesn't. So the specific intensity I is the surface brightness or the brightness of one little patch of the sun um, as it's shining on the earth. So, um, so we have a less solid angle of the, of the sun, right? The moon is blocking out more and more of it, but every little um, patch of the sun uh, has that same surface brightness and that's what specific intensity is measuring. So this is why you're not supposed to look at the sun during a, a partial eclipse. If you were to stare at the sun you would burn a circular hole in the back of your retina. Um, you know if you just looked at it normally during an eclipse what would happen is the amount of energy per square millimeter on the back of your retina from the sun would be the same. So you would just burn a different shaped hole in the back of your retina if you looked at the sun during a partial eclipse. So neither of those are good. So don't look at the sun during a partial eclipse. Again, the bottom line here is this is showing you the difference between the flux of light that we get from the sun and the specific intensity of the sun, sun's light. By the way, if you went to Mercury, uh, the sun appears um, about uh, three times larger in diameter from Mercury, so nine times the solid angle. So the flux that we would get from the sun on Mercury would be nine times larger, but the specific intensity is exactly the same. The sun would be larger in the sky, but the surface brightness is exactly the same on Mercury or Earth or even on Pluto. So don't look at the sun if you ever go to Pluto either. It's just as dangerous. So now let's follow a beam of light through space. Um, the specific intensity of a beam of light in empty space is constant. Okay, so that's what we were just talking about. When light propagates through a medium, uh, the following interactions can occur. You can have losses, so you can absorb energy out of that uh, light beam uh, by heating up little particles of dust or smoke, for example, or you can scatter radiation out of our uh, line of sight into a different direction. So that's a way of uh, removing energy from the line that we're looking at. You can have gains. So if this uh, dust layer or this gas layer is heated up, it will glow uh, through emission processes. So that would happen, uh, say, in a, a glowing nebula, as we'll see later on in space. And scattering could also be um, a source of a gain. So if you had an initial ray coming in this way and it scatters 
off of a particle, it might scatter into your line of sight. So scattering can both remove or add uh, radiation to, um, to a particular direction that you're looking at in space. Okay, let's look at absorption first. So this uh, gray rectangle is supposed to be a layer of gas out in space. We'll assume that radiation is uh, coming from, say, some distant star, and it's coming uh, on the back side of the gas layer. I nu will be the initial intensity of the beam of light. After it passes through the gas layer, it will change by amount uh, di nu. If only absorption is taking place, di nu will be negative, will be removing energy from the light beam. So di nu will be negative, so this quantity over here will be less than the initial, that's why I drew the arrow shorter. We'll call the density of the gas rho. The thickness uh, will be called ds. And the amount of radiation absorbed by this layer of gas uh, is given by negative kappa nu rho i nu ds. So the amount of radiation absorbed um, is proportional to the density, it's proportional to how much initial radiation you have going in, and it's proportional to the thickness of the layer, assuming it's infinitesimally thin. This kappa value is called the opacity or the absorption coefficient of the gas. It's uh, in units of meter squared per kilogram. Uh, so that's kind of telling you the cross-sectional area for absorption per unit mass of the absorbers. Uh, we don't worry about that too much. Just know that uh, when the opacity kappa is large, you'll be absorbing more energy from your light beam. When the opacity is less, you'll be absorbing less energy. So kappa is a property of the gas itself. As we'll see, when you're near a spectral line, uh, like an absorption line, kappa will be very large. When you're off of the absorption line, kappa will be very small. So let's now look at um, integrating this result through a, a layer that has a finite thickness given by capital L. So we'll take the result from the previous page and integrate it across the thickness of this gas layer. So uh, to do the integral, we'll do separation of variables. So we'll move the I nu um, to the other side of the equation, divide through by I nu. So if we integrate di nu over i nu, we get the natural log. If you plug in the limits, the upper limit would be where you're leaving the gas layer. We'll just call that i nu coming out this side. And we'll call the initial intensity coming into the layer i naught. So that's the, the log of the final intensity minus the log of the initial intensity. And it's the integral of the opacity times the density ds, and these quantities may change to the gas layer, so we'll just leave it as this integral for now. Um, rearranging the log, you can write this as the log of i nu over i naught. If we take, um, if we raise each side of this equation um, by the exponential e, then we can find, we can solve for the intensity. So the intensity coming out of our gas layer gas layer will be the initial intensity times e to the negative that integral, um, which is somewhat awkward. So um, we typically define that quantity. We call we, we give this quantity a name. So this integral is called the optical depth through the gas layer. Um, kappa rho ds is a dimensionless quantity. So rho is kilograms per meter squared, kappa is a meter squared per kilogram, and ds is a meter. So all those things cancel out. So this is a dimensionless quantity. Using the substitution, we get a very simple result for the intensity through an absorbing layer. It says that the intensity of light coming out is equal to the initial intensity times e to the negative optical depth of the gas layer. So here's a plot. So this is plotting intensity as a function of optical depth. We'll look at a couple of limits. So when 
when tau is much, much greater than one, this exponential rapidly goes to zero. So if the optical depth is very large, the resultant intensity is going to be very small. Not much light is making it through. That's called optically thick. If tau is much less than one, uh, then you can make the approximation that e to the negative tau is one minus tau. That's the Taylor series approximation. Um, and so in this limit, the change in the intensity through the layer um, is just proportional to the optical depth. The middle case, um, when when tau equals one, it's kind of ne it's in neither of those extremes. So when tau is equal to one, we have i nu equals i naught e to the negative one. So in other words, the intensity is just the initial intensity divided by e. So it's you know that's about one third. So the intensity getting through will be about one third of what it initially was. So you're starting to get some pretty heavy attenuation by an optical depth of one. Um, it's a little bit hard to see through. So here's an example of smog in Los Angeles. So the image on the right shows the buildings in downtown LA and the San Bernardino Mountains in the background. You get a pretty clear view of each, and so there's not much attenuation by the smog, and so we say that this is optically thin at where tau is much less than one. So an optically thin case, you get a clear view of things. When you get a lot of smog building up and you can still make up out features, but it's just um, really attenuated by the smog, uh, you could say that order of magnitude, the optical depth is around one, where the smog is starting to have a significant impact on what you see. And in the other extreme, uh, when uh, the smog completely obscures uh, what you're looking at, you say that that is optically thick. So in this picture, the San Bernardino Mountains are there in the background. Uh, you just can't see them because, uh, because of all the smog obscuring their view. All right, so here's a simple question for you to ponder. California state law requires the front side windows on your car to transmit at least 70% of the light, of the incident light. So find the maximum optical depth of your window tinting. So all you're doing is using that previous definition, and you can just plug in values and solve for what tau is. Right, let's look at this result one more time. And this, in this case, we'll assume that the density and the opacity are constant throughout the layer. So it's a uniform layer. So the optical depth is given by this. In this case, tau and rho are constant, so we can bring them outside the integral. And this integral is just going to be um, the thickness of the layer S. So we see that for a homogeneous medium, the optical depth is just K rho S. So the optical depth is proportional to uh, the thickness of the layer and to the density and to the opacity. We can define the E-folding depth of the gas layer as L is 1 over kappa rho. You can then write the optical depth as, let's see here, so if you plug in kappa rho is equal to 1 over L, kappa rho is 1 over L, you can write this as just tau is equal to S over L. So in this case, we can write um, our radiative transfer solution uh, for an absorbing medium very simply. The resultant intensity is just the initial intensity times E to the negative S over L, where L is this E-folding depth of the gas. Uh, this is just another way of writing the, uh, the equation. All right, so uh, there are lots of sources of opacity. Um, a lot of them uh, come from atomic and molecular absorption processes. So bound-bound absorption would just be the transition between two bound states and a hydrogen or any kind of atom. So a photon comes along, uh, it's absorbed by an electron, the electron gets kicked up to another bound state. Um, that's bound-bound absorption. Bound-free absorption is when the atom is ionized by the photon. Free-free absorption is when an electron that's near an ion uh, absorbs the photon's energy. Electron or Thomson scattering is another form of, of opacity. And then Rayleigh scattering is when you have like a uh, molecule or an atom that's uh, polarizable.
So anyway, we'll, we're not going to go through all these in detail, but just know that there's lots of different like physical atomic processes that give rise to this opacity. And we'll get back to these later. All right, let's now look at emission processes. Uh, we'll look at the same scenario, although now instead of having the gas uh, absorbing radiation, it's just going to be glowing and giving off radiation. So same geometry as before, although now our di nu is going to be a positive number uh, because we're adding to the beam of light as it goes through. So di nu will be positive. Uh, the, the incremental amount of uh, the specific intensity change is given by j nu rho ds where J nu is now the emission coefficient of the gas. So it's telling you how bright the gas is glowing um, per every kilogram of material. Let's now include both. So now we're going to have a layer that has both absorption and emission processes in it. And we want to solve the equation for this scenario. So uh, we'll divide through by k rho ds. So on the left-hand side, we'll get minus 1 over kappa rho di ds. All these terms divide out, so we just have the intensity. And then the thing on the right is going to be, oh, that's a typo. That should say j nu over k nu. That quantity, uh, j nu over k nu, is called the source function. And we'll see that has a, a very special meaning here in just a minute. So plugging in, substituting in for the source function, this is our differential equation. We'll uh, divide through by the negative sign, so it looks like that. And if we replace, remember that the optical depth was the integral of k rho or kappa rho ds. So if you take the differential of that, d tau is just equal to k rho ds. So k rho ds is what we have on the left-hand side here, so we can just replace this with d tau. So we see that the transfer equation uh, in its simplest form can be written as di nu d tau equals the source function minus the intensity of the radiation. So let's solve the transfer equation for a uniform layer. So we're going to assume that the source function and the density of the gas are constant throughout the gas layer. And we want to solve for I nu as a function of the optical depth. The easiest way of doing this is to substitute Y is equal to the, uh, the thing on the right-hand side, so the source function minus the intensity. So dy is minus di, di nu. Our equation now takes this very simple form, uh, do separation of variables, so divide through by y, multiply through by negative d tau. When you integrate the thing on the left, you get the log, natural log function. Com move it around, combine it like this, and then take e to each side of the equation, and you get this, that y of tau is equal to the initial value of y times e to the negative tau. So now we've got to substitute in what we had for y. So we get the source function minus the intensity is the source function minus the initial intensity times e to the negative tau. Remember, we're assuming that the source function is constant throughout, um, throughout the integration. If you rearrange this, you can solve for i nu. You you group the two terms that have the source functions in them, like this. And you can show that the intensity is the initial intensity times e to the negative tau. That's, that's the result that we had just for pure absorption. And then now we have the source function times 1 minus e to the negative tau. So this is due to emission processes over here. So let's look at a special case of our solution to the transfer equation. We're going to look at the case uh, where we have no background radiation. So we're going to assume that we're looking at some astronomical, say, gas out in space, and it's just kind of glowing due to its own emission. So we're not going to assume there's like background starlight or anything. So we're going to get rid of that term. So this is what our transfer 
equation solution looks like. So we're going to look at two cases. The first case is uh, the optically thin case. So in that case, the, uh, the uh, optical depth is much less than 1. When tau is much less than 1, e to the negative tau is 1 minus tau. So the 1 minus 1s cancel, and then you get a negative negative tau. So the intensity is proportional to the source function times the optical depth. If we plug in for a uniform uh, slab of material, that the optical depth is just kappa rho L, you get this result. And we see that the intensity is proportional to, to both the, um, the opacity, kappa, and this quantity rho L. So rho L is called the column density through the gas. And if you're looking out at some nebula or something, uh, the column density is kind of like the integrated gas density along your line of sight. So the interesting thing here is that uh, it's that the intensity is also proportional to the absorption coefficient. So suppose um, you're looking at some gas as a function of wavelength or frequency. Um, wherever you're going to have an absorption feature, the opacity of that that gas is going to go up so when you're on an absorption line you'll you'll have increased opacity and then when you get off the line it'll go back down again so what this is saying is that the intensity of some glowing gas uh, mimics what that opacity curve looks like as a function of frequency so so what this is is an emission line so you're going to see an emission line of of the glowing gas at the frequency uh, where the, um, say, the bound-bound transition would occur. In case two, uh, we have the optically thick case. So now tau is much greater than one. When tau, say, goes to infinity, e to the negative tau will go to zero. So in that case, the intensity is just proportional to the source function. So i is just proportional to the source function. If um, the system is in local thermodynamic equilibrium, this is just equal to the Planck function or the black body curve. So in this case, you don't see any features like this that are telling you about the composition of the gas anymore. All you're seeing is the Planck function and that doesn't have details about the composition of the gas. So um, here's two actual examples where these two limits occur so an optically thin case is where you have like glowing gas that's like floating around out in our galaxy that's been heated up by nearby stars so this um this nebula or this glowing cloud of gas in space is in the constellation orion this is called the horsehead nebula because it looks that silhouette looks like a little horse's head um, this is uh, mostly hydrogen and helium gas with some trace other elements. But again, we're, the emission that we're seeing is optically thin, so you're kind of looking through this entire cloud. Um, and so the brightness of these different uh, layers of gas is telling you something about how much gas is present. The more gas you have, um, the brighter it's gonna be. There's also some temperature effects in there also, but um, but but the point is you can determine how much gas is along your line of sight because it's optically thin. In the optically thick case, that's like the case of the sun. So when you're looking at the sun, you don't see all the way through the sun. You're just looking at the outer surface of the sun. And so here, the, the surface of the sun, to a good approximation, is glowing like a black body. Now there's a thin atmosphere of the sun above that surface, that um, is transparent, and that's why we see absorption lines in the in the sun's atmosphere. But um, uh, but you can think of that that surface of the sun itself as as glowing as a black body that is optically thick. Okay, so that's it. In the next lecture, we will talk about radio astronomy.